So in the 1660s, there were no internet videos. I know that's kind of a profound statement, something you'd expect at TED, right? So what I want to do is explain how something used to happen. See, a long time ago, if somebody had something interesting or unexpected they wanted to explain to other people, they had to do it in person, right? So a long time ago, there was a guy named Prince Rupert of Bavaria, and he had something really interesting he wanted to show people about science. I'm going to do it right now, just like he used to. First of all, let me get this set up. I borrowed a glass for my hotel room. Just borrowed it, all right? I need to goggle up, because a little science is about to happen. Let's get ready here. Behold. I don't know if you knew this or not, but glass. Let's see, I got a hammer. Here we go. Thank you. Yeah, I know. It's pretty awesome. So glass breaks, right? But Prince Rupert of Bavaria brought something over to King Charles II in England, and he wanted to show it to him because it was different. Look at this. This is called a Prince Rupert's Drop because of that guy right there. But it's just a little bit different. If you take it and you tap it with the same hammer, it won't break, even though it's glass. Isn't that weird? But there's something different about this. If you take the tail, see I've got a bulb, and I've got the tail. If I just nick the very end of it, watch what happens. It doesn't break. It does something a little bit crazier than that. It explodes. It's a little unexpected, isn't it? So that's called a Prince Rupert's Drop. So a long time ago, if you wanted to explain a phenomenon like that, you had to get in front of people and you had to show it to them, just like I just did, right? Which is pretty cool, but you can show it to what, like a thousand people? But this is going to be on the internet, so how many people are going to see it? A lot. So that's what I've been doing for the past several years. I've been creating internet videos and showing phenomena like this, the unexpected, to all different kinds of people. This is the Prince Rupert's Drop. We filmed it with a high-speed camera at 100,000 frames per second, and I explained the science behind how it works. I'm not going to tell you about it right now because I want your internet view. <laughs> so I'll let, you go. I'll let you go look at that yourself. It's called The Mystery of the Prince Rupert's Drop. And right now, about 4 million people have seen that. It's pretty cool, right? So that's what I do. My name is Destin Salen. I have a YouTube channel called Smarter Every Day. And basically, I go around trying to discover the unexpected things, the things that are right in front of you, but you don't really know about them. This is how I got started. <laughs> I know it's a chicken. So check this out. So, so everybody's seen a, a chicken, right? This is Vienna. This is kind of high class. So you guys might not own chickens like we do. But, but I own chickens. And my daughter, she gets eggs for us. So um, I don't know if you knew this, but if you take a chicken and you move it around, have you seen this? Well, just watch. Uh, you know, and guys, if you move him around, control, his head will stay in loops. one spot. And so you have Check to know out. your position and where your relative motion is going so you can compensate for it but chickens are really good at this so I'll show you watch his head stay totally stationary yeah as I move his body Thanks. I can move his body in pretty much any direction and his head stays rock solid in one position yeah 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 I get it I get it I get it I get it so this is really hard to do so anyway he so knows exactly are you laughing where his at body me or with me here body's moving so what, what I want to explain about this video is when I put this video up, I'm, you're supposed to be listening to me. This is a TED Talk. Listen to me. No, okay. Listen, listen. I have a really important point, and it's going to make you feel important and stuff. Just listen. So when I put that video up on the Internet, I, I wasn't thinking, hey, this is pretty cool. Check it out. Chicken does this. It's gonna, I'm going to love it. I put that video on the internet because at the time I was taking classes in guidance and I'm still wearing glasses, aren't I? I was taking classes in guidance and control, and I understood that that chicken was a closed loop system. And what he was doing is he was tracking the position of his head based on two things based on inertial inputs from his body and also on optical inputs, which is really fascinating. We have something called the vestibulo-ocular reflex, so we can track things with our eyes like this. I'm, I can move my head and I can track you. Chickens can't do that, which is why they put their head in a spot and then they walk under their head, <laughs> and they put their head in the spot and they walk under their head again. Does that make sense? So 
So that's what I was, that's the level I was at when I made this video, right? But I put it on the internet and everybody has the same reaction you do. Oh, look at that little redneck with his little chicken. Isn't that funny? <laughs> so, so I realized at that point in time, I was like, so I just played with a chicken on the internet and millions of people like it for a totally different reason than why I do. <laughs> what is going on? So anyway, I kept doing it. So this is a video of me with my, my children. I don't know if you know this, but uh, if we I've got a pendulum suspended go forward from the top in a car, of our family van, and we're just going to drive forward, we're going to accelerate. So if we're going that way, which direction do you think this pendulum should go? What do you think? What do you Three, think? Two, Driving one, forward. Go. Yes. Which way is it going? My way. That's right. It's because I'm accelerating, right? Yeah, that okay, makes sense. So now right? what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace this pendulum with a balloon. And we should see the same thing, right? Let me cut this off. So what we're going to do is we're going to accelerate that way so we have the mass of the balloon and the acceleration so that should net in a force and we'll have to react with this string, right? You guys ready? Yes, sir. Three, yes, sir. two, one, go. Oh. Wait a second. What's happening there? What just happened? That's a little unexpected, isn't it? Now this stuff is all around you. You're just not looking for it. Seriously, like this morning, we ate breakfast at the hotel where I stole that glass from. I'm going to have to figure that one out. But, but there, you can put honey on your toast in the morning. You, you guys ever do this? So if you take honey and you drizzle it on your toast, this is something called the liquid rope coil effect. Have you ever seen this? This might have happened in front of you. You just hadn't seen it because it wasn't 1,000 frames per second. But this is very, very, very complicated, and you can do this every morning. If you look at it, this coil here is a super-duper complicated math function. So we've got the diameter of, of the liquid rope there at the top, the diameter at the bottom, they're different, and then we have the mass flow rate, and then we can calculate an orbital frequency of, of the honey here. Well, what's interesting about this is I've seen this a lot in my life, right? But I've never taken the moment to think about what it was, because this is still not understood fully by science. Did you know that? No, seriously, we don't know exactly what happened. We know there's four regimes that it operates in. There's the inertial regime, there's the gravitational regime, there's, one th there's something called the inertial gravitational regime. We don't really understand it. We do know it's a 17th order polynomial with 18 boundary conditions, but we don't know what that means. <laughs> you see, this stuff is all over the place. I promise you, you'll see something on the way home if you just look at the world a little bit differently. So people, people ask me often when they meet me, they say, so where do you get your ideas for these videos? And the real answer is, I have no idea. I really don't. I just look at the world a little bit differently. And this is what I want to challenge you to do. This is all I want. If you hear nothing else in this whole TEDx thing, I want you to hear this. Look at the world differently. You got it? Because if you look at the world differently, you're going to see things that are more beautiful than you've ever thought of before, even though they were right in front of your face the whole time. But another thing I want to say, and it's not lost on me that I'm saying this at a TEDx event, in a world of talkers, you need to be a thinker and a doer, okay? You've heard a lot of talking. I'm talking. But in a world of talkers, you need to be a thinker and a doer because that's where crazy stuff starts happening, right? Until you actually do something, you're not actually going to experience anything strange. Make a discovery, perhaps. So I was actually asked to go to the rainforest. You ever read the YouTube comments? <laughs> Anybody ever read the comments on YouTube? It's pretty bad stuff, right? Never read the comments. I made the mistake of reading the comments on YouTube one time, and this guy, I promise this is how this happens, he's like, hey, uh, what would you do if you went to the rainforest for a week? I was like, well, that's a strange comment out of 1,500 comments on this video. I think I'll, uh, well, I don't know what I would do. Why do you ask? And this guy asked me to come to the rainforest. So what do you do when people ask you to go to the jungle on the Internet? You go to the jungle, <laughs> right? So that's what I did. I went down to, it's called the Tambopata Research Center in South America in Peru, and I started just exploring. I had no business there. I'm an aerospace engineer from Alabama. <laughs> yeah, let's go to the rainforest. <laughs> so I did. I went with a buddy of mine named, let's see, Gordon McGlattery. He's an audio engineer. I also met a couple of guys down there, Jeff and Phil. We just walked around the jungle and just did stuff. And we came across this, which is a pile of caterpillars. And, and most people, when they see a pile of caterpillars, they're like, well, it's, it's kind of weird. Why would caterpillars do that? Are they trying to look like, you know, feces so something doesn't come and eat them? What are they doing? And then I started looking at it a little bit more because, you know, I've done some motion control stuff, and then I realized 
that, that that caterpillar on top, he's actually not having to walk as much as the caterpillar on the bottom. Does that make sense? So you got this caterpillar on the bottom, he's moving, and the caterpillar above him is moving on top of him. And then I got to realize it, because I used my engineer brain, and I looked at it a little bit different, because I'm not an entomologist or anything like that. I realized that the whole group of caterpillars can move faster if they move as a group. Does that make any sense? And I, I came home like, surely this is a well-known phenomenon. I'm going to start Googling, try to figure out what's going on. Nobody had talked about it before because they didn't have a, an idiot from Alabama down there looking at a pile of caterpillars in the, rain, in the rainforest. Does that make sense? So, so what I'm saying is just look at the world differently because that's where discoveries happen. So here's another interesting discovery we made. Um, Gordon, my friend, we're, we're tired, right? We're in the jungle. We had not slept very well. It's all sweaty at night. And I, Gordon's like, I kind of want to go on a jungle walk, record some audio, because that's what I do. I'm an audio engineer. I'm like, whatever, Gordon. I'll go to the jungle with you. So there's this guy named Phil Torres, a buddy of ours, and he's down there. He's an entomologist. We say, hey, Phil, can we go on a jungle walk? And, you know, you take us places where we don't get bit by animals that will kill us? He's like, yeah, let's go. So we're, we're walking. We're walking through the jungle. And all of a sudden, Gordon says, what is this? I was like, I don't know. What is it? It's a spider. We go up to the spider and we start looking at it, and it's actually a spider that has never been documented before. That is not the spider on the left. That is a fake spider made by a spider. Seriously. Eight legs. They're made from debris in his web. He's even, he's even got an abdomen that he's created, and he's got a cephalothorax, just like real spiders. But it's a spider that made that. And I caught the moment on video that we potentially discovered a new species. Watch this. There's a tiny, it's a tiny spider disguised as a big spider. Yeah, Shut up. One, two, three, yeah. four, five, six, seven, eight. Correct number you of can, legs. You can hear the Alabama just oh, come yeah. through, right? Okay, so we are in the jungle, and our current theory is that this tiny, tiny, tiny spider at the top of this, keep me back there, Gordon, it's working good. This tiny spider has created... Is that dust, what are we thinking? No idea. Debris, or something like Debris that looks like a big spider, and he's vibrating the whole web to make it look like he is a big spider. Listen to what I say this here. This doesn't seem like it could be true. This doesn't seem like it could be true. So we that happened. Um, we discovered yeah. potentially a new spider species in the rainforest because we didn't know what we were looking at, but we were looking at it a little bit differently. That's awesome. I mean, you can't plan stuff like that. But this is the point here. So discoveries often happen. When you venture into the unknown, you get outside your comfort zone. You don't know what you're doing. And uh, if this seems like some kind of revelation to you, then you don't know the definition of the word discovery. Because discoveries don't happen in places where things haven't been discovered. Does that make sense? I, I think I said that right. You get what I'm saying. So in order to discover something awesome, you have to be somewhere that you don't really know what's going on. Right? So that's what we did. Are you in a place in your life where you can make discoveries? I don't know. Think about that. So you might think this uh, piece of paper is interesting. People think I, I do YouTube videos because, hey, you're, you're real big on YouTube. That's a big thing. Not really. This is why I do it. Um, this is a letter I got from NASA telling me that I am not qualified to be an astronaut. <laughs> I've got two of these, actually. I've got two of these letters. So... Um, I want to be an astronaut, like I do. Like people say, yeah, I want to be an astronaut, that'd be cool. But I, I, yeah, you want to be an astronaut. I really want to be an astronaut. And I'm not just saying it. I like do stuff to try to be an astronaut. This is my granddad. This is why I think I have the motivation to be an astronaut. See, when I was young, he worked for NASA, and he worked on rockets, and he worked on big stands that you would test rockets on. And he just, we would walk outside at night when I'd spend the night with him. He'd, he'd look up at the sky and say, look at the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, look at Sagittarius. We just breathe space. We were always reading books about Mars, all this stuff. And uh, even the way Granddaddy would talk to me was different. He would say, he wouldn't say, I love you. You know, you know granddads love their, their grandsons. He wouldn't say, I love you. He'd say something weird. He said, I love you to the comet belt and back. What the heck does that mean? I'm 10 years old. I don't, I don't understand where the comet belt is and why Granddaddy loves me there. I don't get it. He said, I love you to the comet belt. More about that later. That's a pretty interesting thing to say to a 10-year-old, I think. So um, I wanted to be an astronaut, so I decided to do things that astronauts would do. So in the top left, you can see the moon buggy had to fold out 
and you had to be able to drive it off. So the thing is, uh, you might not know anybody else that has a moon buggy scar, but I actually have a scar on my leg from this moon buggy. My wife made me do that. She was in the passenger seat and made me pedal harder. So anyway, I did things that looked like space things, right? Um, I did undergraduate research, got to fly on the vomit comet, as they call it, the weightless wonder. Um, I just wanted to be an astronaut, and I still do. And so what kinds of things do you study? This sort of stuff. It's really cool, by the way. We can talk about that later if anybody wants to. So then I started reaching out and trying to talk to people that did this sort of things for real, right? So I explained one time on my YouTube channel how cats, if you drop them, they'll flip. And it seems like they violate the conservation of angular momentum, if you know anything about <laughs> science. But they actually don't. Um, cat flipping, you might not know it. This goes back to look at the world differently. This is one of the most complicated things you can do on a piece of paper when it comes to math. It's very, very complicated. So I asked the guys up at the space station, how a cat flips without touching anything and inserting rotational momentum into his system, right? <laughs> and and so, so NASA hears that and they're like, you know, that's actually not a really bad question. Let's talk to the astronauts and have them do it and demonstrate it for this guy in Alabama. So that's what we did. So that's the kind of thing that I, I'm, I'm doing. I'm just trying to look at the world differently and I want you to do the same. In oral talkers, I want you to be a thinker and a doer. Does it make sense to drop a cat in your backyard and film it and try to analyze it? <laughs> well, heck yeah, it does. It's awesome. <laughs> does it make sense to go to the rainforest and try to figure out a pile of caterpillars? Yeah, it's pretty awesome. But in the world of talkers, are you being a thinker and a doer? Think about that. I'm trying to. I'm trying to look at the world differently. See, something else happened. My, my granddad died. And um, so I went off to university and I was studying. I'm trying to be an astronaut, all this good stuff. And I realized something one day. I realized that I was in a class and I was calculating the delta V requirements for a manned mission to Mars on paper. You can do that. It's easy math. So I'm sitting there doing the math and I, I realized, see, my granddaddy, he, did, he knew he probably wasn't going to be around to, you know, get me excited about all this stuff forever. He was going to die. But when he told that 10-year-old boy... I love you to the comet belt, and it made no sense to the 10-year-old boy. I had this moment. I was sitting there doing this math, and it clicked in my head. And I look up, and there's a bunch of people pencil whipping things around the, around the room. And I looked up, and I was like, oh, my goodness, the comet belt. He loves me to the comet belt. The comet belt's on the other side of Mars. And then I looked at my piece of paper, and I looked at the delta V requirements for the different stages of the mission, and I said, it's, it's not only possible for man to go to Mars, it's probable. It's going to happen looking at the paper, and then I had that moment, and I realized that my granddaddy was trying to get me excited about something long after he was dead, and all he did was invest a little time in my life and do that. Does that make any sense? It's a very personal thing. It might not mean as much to you, but to me, this is everything. So when I realized that in a world of talkers, if I was a thinker and a doer, and I could look at the world differently, just because my granddaddy did that for me a long time ago and told me how to view the world, if I just spend a little bit of time doing that with my own children and with maybe your children by showing them the same stuff on the Internet, then perhaps we can all change the world. Does that make sense? It's, I'm not sure if I'm making, uh, I'm making the point exactly clear, but what I want to make sure you understand is that in a world of talkers, you have to be a thinker and a doer. You have to look at the world differently because when you do that, you do crazy things. Like you inspire the next generation of people to do stuff that you're not capable of doing because the technology doesn't exist yet. You change things just because instead of talking about stuff, you're doing stuff. I'm Destin. You're getting smarter every day. Have a good one.